Section number two of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emily Hancock. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section number two. The World of Books and the World's Work. By Henry E. Legler. Turning for a text to Victor Hugo's stirring epic of Paris, these words may be found in the section for May and in the third chapter thereof. A library implies an act of faith which generations still in darkness hid sign in their night in witness of the dawn. When Johann Gutenberg in his secret workshop poured the molten metal into the rough matrices he had cut for separate types, the instrument for the spread of democracy was created. When early cavaliers and Puritans planted the crude beginnings of free public schools, the forces of democracy were multiplied. When half a century ago the first meager beginnings of the public library movement were evolved, democracy was for all time assured. Thus have three great stages, separated each by a span of two hundred years from that preceding, marked that world development whose ultimate meaning is not equality of station or possession, but equality of opportunity. Not without stress and strife have these yet fragmentary results been achieved. Not without travail and difficulties will universal acceptance be accorded in the days to come. But no one may doubt the final outcome which shall crown the struggle of the centuries. The world was old when typography was invented. Less than five centuries have passed since then, and in this interval, by the brief period in the long history of human endeavor, there has been more enlargement of opportunity for the average man and woman than in all the time that went before. Without the instrumentality of the printed page, without the reproductive processes that give to all the world in myriad tongues the thought of all the centuries, slavery, serfdom, and feudalism would still shackle the millions not so fortunate as to be born to purple and ermine and fine linen. The evolution of the book is, therefore, the history of the unfoldment of human rights. The chained tome in its medieval prison cell has been supplanted by the handy volume freely sent from the hospitable public library to the homes of the common people. The humblest citizen today has at his command books in number and in kind which royal treasuries could not have purchased five hundred years ago. In the sixteenth century it took a flock of sheep to furnish the vellum for one edition of a book, and the product was for the very few. In the 20th century, a forest is felled to supply the paper for an edition, and the output goes to many hundred thousand readers. As books have multiplied, learning has been more widely disseminated. As more people have become educated, the demand for books has increased enormously. The multiplication of books has stimulated the writing of them, and the inevitable result has been a deterioration of quality proportion to the increase in quantity. In the English language alone since 1880, 206,905 titles of books printed in the United States have been listed, and in 226,365 in Great Britain since 1882. Of these 433,270 titles, 84,722 represent novels. 36,607 issued in the United States and 48,115 in Great Britain. Despite the inclusion of the trivial and the unsound in this vast mass of printed stuff, no one can doubt the magnitude of the service performed in this advancement of humankind. The universities have felt the touch of popular demand, and in this country at least some of them have attempted to respond. Through correspondence courses, short courses, university week conferences, summer schools, local forums, traveling instructors, and other media of extension, many institutions of higher learning have given recognition to the appeal of the masses. Logically, with this enlargement of educational opportunity, the amplification of library facilities has kept pace. The libraries have become, in a real sense, the laboratory of learning. 
intended primarily as great storehouses for the accumulation and preservation rather than the use of manuscripts and books their doors have been opened wide to all farers in search of truth or mental stimulus in a report to the english king sir william berkeley wrote as governor of virginia in sixteen forty two i thank god there are no free schools nor printing and i hope we shall not have them these hundred years for learning has brought disobedience into the world and printing has divulged them and libels against the best government god keep us from both governor berkeley's sentiments expressed by him in turgid rhetoric were held in his day by most men in authority but that did not prevent the planting of little schoolhouses here and there and men of much vision and little property bequeathed their possessions for maintaining them many a school had its origin in a bequest comprising a few milch kine a horse or two or a crop of tobacco in some instances slaves from such beginnings with such endowments was evolved three hundred years ago the public system of education which today prodigally promises though it but niggardly realizes sixteen years of schooling for every boy and girl in the land if the span of years needed for the development of the free library system has been much shorter the hostile attitude of influential men and the privations that attended pioneer efforts were no less marked as recently as eighteen eighty nine the writer of an article in the north american review labeled his attack are public libraries public blessings and answers his own question in no uncertain negative not only have the public libraries as a whole failed to reach their proper aim of giving the means of education to the people he protested but they have gone aside from their true path to furnish amusement and that in part of a pernicious character chiefly to the young and he added i might have mentioned other possible dangers such as the power of the directors of any library to make it a propaganda of any delusive ism or doctrine subversive of morality society or government but i would prefer to rest my case here and it was somewhat later than this that the pages of the century gave space to correspondence in opposition to the establishment of a public library system for the city of new york these were but echoes of earlier antagonisms for the documentary material dealing with the beginnings of the public library movement the searcher must delve within the thousand pages of a portly folio volume issued by the british government sixty years ago if one possesses patience sufficient to read the immense mass of dry evidence compiled by a parliamentary commission and presented to both houses of parliament by command of her majesty some interesting facts in library history will be found a young man of twenty-three then an underling in the service of the british museum afterwards an eminent librarian was one of the principal witnesses edward edwards had the gift of vision Half a century before public libraries became the people's universities as they are today, his prophetic tongue gave utterance to what has since become the keynote of library aims and policies. Badgered by hostile inquisitors, ridiculed by press and politicians, he undeviatingly clung to his views, and he lived to see his prophecy realized great libraries they had been before his day remarkable as the storehouse of knowledge in printed form was and is in our own day the institution with which he was associated but in these rich reference collections intended for the student of research the element of popular use was lacking to have suggested the loan of a single book for use outside the four walls of the library would have startled and benumbed everyone in authority and everyone without authority from the members of the governing board to librarians sub-librarians and messenger boys this stripling faced the members of parliament and without hesitation proclaimed his thesis it is not merely to open the library to persons who from the engrossing nature of their engagements of business are at present utterly excluded from it but it is also that the library may be made a direct agent in some degree in the work of national education let not any one be alarmed lest something very theoretical or very revolutionary should be proposed i merely suggest that the library should be opened to a class of men quite shut out from it by its present regulations then he added 
In such a country as this, there should be one great national storehouse. But in addition to this, there should be libraries in different quarters on a humbler scale, very freely accessible. One of the ablest members of Parliament, William Ewart of Liverpool, became intensely interested in the views expressed by young Edwards, and from that day was counted the consistent champion of library privileges for the common people. Largely through his instrumentality, aided by such men as Richard Cobden, John Bright, and Joseph Brotherton, Parliament passed an act for the encouragement of museums. Out of this measure grew the later Public Libraries Act, this notable step was not accomplished without bitter opposition. The next thing we will be asked to do, said one indignant member on the floor of the house, is to furnish people with quiots and peg tops and footballs at the expense of taxpayers. Soon we will be thinking of introducing the performances of punch for the amusement of people. Events in England influenced similar movements in the United States. In a letter to Edward Everett in 1851, Mr. George Tickner gave the first impetus to the establishment of a free public library in Boston, the first in the new world to be maintained permanently by the people for the people. I would establish a library which differs from all free libraries yet attempted, he wrote. I mean one in which any popular books, tending to moral and intellectual improvement, shall be furnished in such numbers of copies that many persons can be reading the same book at the same time. In short, that not only the best books of all sorts, but the pleasant literature of the day shall be made accessible to the whole people when they most care for it, that is, when it is new and fresh." Sixty years after the date of Mr. Tigner's letter, and chiefly within the last two decades of the period, the public library movement has assumed a place in public education which, relatively, the public school movement attained only after three hundred years of effort. When Thomas Bodley died in 1613, in all Europe there were but three libraries accessible to the public, the Bodleian, the Angela Rocca at Rome, and the Ambrosian at Milan. In 1841, the Penny Cyclopedia devoted about four inches of a narrow column to the subject of libraries, ancient and modern, and limited its reference to American libraries to one sentence, obtained at second hand from an older contemporary. In the United States of America, according to the Encyclopedia Americana, the principal libraries are, or were in 1831, that of Harvard College, containing 36,000 volumes, the Philadelphia Library, containing 27,000 volumes, that of the Boston Athenaeum, containing 26,000, that of Congress, containing 16,000, and that of Charleston, containing 13,000. It is only since 1867 that the federal government has deemed it worthwhile to compile library statistics, and the first comprehensive figures were gathered in 1875. It is worth noting that then they embraced all libraries comprising 300 volumes, and that in 1893 no mention is made of collections containing less than a 1,000 volumes, while the most recent official enumeration makes 5,000 volumes the unit of consideration. From these official figures may be gleaned something of the extraordinary growth of libraries, both numerically and in size. In 1875, including school libraries, there were 2,039 containing 1,000 volumes. Ten years later, there were 4,026. Ten years after that, 8,000. And at this date, there are in this class not less than 12,000, while the recorded number comprising 300 volumes or more reaches the substantial total of 15,634, and 2,298 of these catalog in excess of 5,000 volumes each. These figures show phenomenal growth, but even more impressive are the facts that give their full meaning and detail. From a striking compilation issued in Germany by De Brucke a few weeks ago, together with figures extracted by means of a questionnaire supplemented by statistical material gathered by the Bureau of Education, the facts which follow have been deduced. Counting the great libraries of the world, the six continents abutting the seven seas possess 324 libraries whose book collections number in excess of 100,000 volumes each, and of these, 79, or approximately one-fourth, are located in the Americas. 
Of the 79 libraries, 72 are in the United States, including university, public, governmental, and miscellaneous institutions, with a combined collection of 19,295,000 volumes. If this statistical inquiry is pursued further, a reason becomes apparent why millions are starved for want of books while other millions seemingly have a surfeit of them. The rural regions, save in a handful of commonwealths whose library commissions or state libraries actively administer traveling libraries, the book supply is practically negligible. Even the hundreds of itinerating libraries but meagerly meet the want. All the traveling libraries in all the United States have a total issue annually less than that of any one of 20 municipal systems that can be named. The public library facilities in at least 6,000 of the smaller towns are pitifully insufficient and in hundreds of them wholly absent. The movement to supply books to the people was first launched in the rural region 70 years ago. Indeed, the movement for popular education, known as the America Lyceum, which forecasts the activities of the modern public library, just as the Mechanics Institute of Great Britain prepared the soil for them in that country, flourished chiefly in the less thickly settled centers of population. The early district school libraries melted away in New York State and Wisconsin and other states, and the devastated shelves have never been amply renewed. The library commissions are valiantly and energetically endeavoring to supply the want, but their efforts are all too feebly supported by their respective states. In this particular, the policy is that which unfortunately obtains as to all educational effort. More than 55% of the young people from 6 to 20 years old, about 17 million of them, live in the country or in towns of less than 2,000 inhabitants. According to an official report from which this statement is extracted, there are 5,000 country schools still taught in primitive log houses, uncomfortable, unsuitable, unventilated, unsanitary, illy equipped, poorly lighted, imperfectly heated. Boys and girls in all stages of advancement receiving instruction from one teacher of very low grade. It is plain why, in the summing up of this report, illiteracy in rural territory is twice as great as in urban territory, notwithstanding that thousands of illiterate immigrants are crowded in the great manufacturing and industrial centers. The illiteracy among native-born children of native parentage is more than three times as great as among native children of foreign parentage, largely on account of the lack of opportunities for education in rural America. In Indian legend Nokomis, the earth symbolizes the strength of motherhood. It may yet chance that the classic myth of the hero who gained his strength because he kissed the earth may be fully understood in America only when the people learn that they will remain strong, as Mr. Munsterberg has put it, only by returning with every generation to the soil. If the states have proved recreant to duty in this particular, the municipalities have shown an increasing conception of educational values. The figures make an imposing statistical array. In the United States, there are 1,222 incorporated places of 5,000 or more inhabitants, and their libraries house 90 million volumes, and with a total yearly use aggregating 110 million issues. Four million volumes a year are added to their shelves, and collectively they derive an income of $20 million. Their permanent endowments, which it must be regretfully said but 600 of them share, now aggregate $40 million. Nearly all of these libraries occupy buildings of their own, Mr. Andrew Carnegie having supplied approximately $42,226,338 for the purpose in the United States, and the balance of the $100 million represented in buildings having been donated by local benefactors or raised by taxation. The population of these 1,222 places is 38,758,584, considerably less than half that of the entire United States. Their book possessions, on the other hand, are nine times as great as those in the rest of the country. The circulation of the books nearly 12 times in volume. Closer analysis of these figures enforces still more strongly the actual concentration of the available book supply. The hundred largest cities of the United States, varying in size from a minimum of 53,684 to a maximum of 4,766,883, 
possess in the aggregate more books than all the rest of the country together and represent the bulk of the trained professional service rendered the great majority of the three thousand graduates whom the library schools have sent into service since the first class was organized in eighteen eighty seven are in these libraries and in the university libraries forty per cent of the books circulated are issued to the dwellers in these one hundred cities and in fifteen of them the stupendous total of thirty million eight hundred thirty four issues for home reading was recorded last year without such analysis as this the statistical totals would be misleading the concentration of resources and of trained service in large centers of population comparatively few in number makes evident the underlying cause for the modern trend of library development a further study of conditions in these human hives justifies the specialized forms of service which have become a marked factor in library extension within a decade with increased resources with vastly improved internal machinery with enlarged conception of opportunity for useful service have come greater liberality of rules and ever widening circles of activity until today no individual and no group of individuals remains outside the radius of library influence if this awakened zeal has spurred to efforts that seem outside the legitimate sphere of library work no undue concern need be felt neither the genius or enthusiasm of the individual nor the enterprise of a group of individuals will ever be permitted to go too rapidly or too far the world's natural conservatism and inherited unbelief stand ever ready to retard or prevent Specialization has been incorporated into library administration chiefly to give expeditious and thorough aid to seekers of information touching a wide variety of interests. Businessmen, legislators, craftsmen, special investigators, and students of every sort. This added duty has not diminished its initial function to make available the literature of all time, nor to satisfy those who go to books for the pure joy of reading the recreative service of the library is as important as the educative or the informative for the great mass of people the problem has been the problem of toil long and uninterrupted the successful struggle of the unions to restrict the hours of labor has developed another problem almost as serious the problem of leisure interwoven with this acute problem is another which subdivision of labor has introduced into modern industrial occupations the terrible fatigue which results from a monotonous repetition of the same process hour after hour day after day week after week such blind concentration in the making of but one piece of a machine or a garment or a watch or any other article of merchandise without knowledge of its relationship to the rest soon wears the human worker out there must be an outlet of play of fun or recreation the librarian need not feel apologetic to the public because perchance his circulation statistics show that seventy per cent of it is classified as fiction if he wishes to reduce this percentage to sixty nine or sixty eight or sixty one let him do it not by discouraging the reading of novels but by stimulating the use of books in other classes of literature but well does he merit his own sense of humiliation and the condemnation of the critics if he needs must feel ashamed of the kind of novels that he puts upon his shelves to quote a fellow librarian who expresses admirably the value of such literature a good story has created many an oasis and many an otherwise arid life many sidedness of interest makes for good morals and millions of our fellows step through the pages of a story-book into a broader world than their nature and their circumstances ever permit them to visit if anything is to stay the narrowing and hardening process which specialization of learning specialization of inquiry and of industry and swift accumulation of wealth are setting up among us it is a return to romance poetry imagination fancy and the general culture we are now taught to despise of all these the novel is a part rather in the novel are all of these but a race may surely find springing up in itself a fresh love of romance in that high sense of that word which can keep it active hopeful ardent progressive perhaps the novel is to be in the next decades part of the outward manifestation of a new birth of this love of breadth and happiness many of the factory workers are young men and young women whose starved imaginations seek an outlet that will not be denied 
In lieu of wholesome recreation and material, they will find clues to life's perplexities in salacious plays, in cheap vaudeville performances, in the suggestive pages of railway literature, in other ways that make for a lowering of moral tone. The reaction that craves amusement of any sort is manifest in the nightly crowded stalls of the cheap theaters. Eight million spectators view every moving picture film that is manufactured. It is estimated that one-sixth of the entire population of New York City and of Chicago attends the theaters on any Sunday of the year. One Sunday evening, at the instance of Miss Jane Addams, an investigation was made of 466 theaters in the latter city, and it was discovered that in the majority of them the leading theme was revenge, the lover following his rival, the outraged husband seeking his wife's betrayer, or the wiping out by death of a blot on a hitherto unstained honor. And, of course, these influences extend to the children, who are always the most ardent and responsive of audiences. There is grave danger that the race will develop a ragtime disposition, a moving picture habit, and a comic supplement mind. It is perhaps too early to point to the specialized attention which libraries have given to the needs of young people as a distinct contribution to society. Another generation must come before material evidence for good or ill becomes apparent. That the work is well worth the thought bestowed, whether present methods survive or are modified, may not be gainsaid. The derelicts of humanity are the wrecks who knew no guiding light. The reformatories and the workhouses, the penal institutions generally, and the charitable ones principally, are not merely a burden upon society, but a reproach for duty unperformed. Society is at last beginning to realize that it is better to perfect machinery of production than to mend the imperfect product. That to dispense charity may ameliorate individual suffering, but does not prevent recurrence. And so more attention is being given prevention than cure. I gave a beggar from my little store of well-earned gold. He spent the shining ore, and came again and yet again, still cold and hungry as before. I gave a thought, and through that thought of mine, he found himself a man, supreme, divine, bold, clothed, and crowned with blessings manifold, and now he begs no more. If numbers and social and industrial importance warrant special library facilities for children, certainly the same reasons underlie the special library work with foreigners, which has within recent years been carried on extensively in the larger cities. Last month, the Census Bureau issued an abstract of startling import to those who view in the coming of vast numbers from across the waters a menace to the institutions of this democracy. According to this official enumeration, in but 14 of 50 cities having over 100,000 inhabitants in 1910 did native whites of native parentage contribute as much as one-half of the total population. The proportion exceeded three-fifths in only four cities. On the other hand, in 22 cities of this class, of which 15 are in New England and the Middle Atlantic divisions, less than one-third of the population were native whites of native parentage, over two-thirds in all, but one of these cities consisting of foreign-born whites and their children. In his ode delivered at Harvard, Lowell eloquently referred to, the pith and marrow of a nation drawing force from all her men, highest, humblest, weakest, all, for her time of need, and then pulsing it again through them, she that lifts up the manhood of the poor, she of the open soul and open door, with room about her hearth for all of mankind. This was written in 1865. Since then, the rim of the Mediterranean has sent its enormous contribution of unskilled and unlettered human beings to the New World. There have been three great tides of migration from overseas. The first came to secure liberty of conscience. The second sought liberty of political thought and action. The third came in quest of bread. And of the three, incomparably, the greater problem of assimilation is that presented by the last comers. Inextricably interwoven are all the complexities which face the great and growing municipalities, politically and industrially and socially. These are the awful problems of congestion and festering slums, of corruption in public life, of the exploitation of womanhood, of terrible struggle with wretchedness and poverty. 
rightly directed the native qualities and strength of these peoples will be a splendid contribution in the making of a virile citizenship wrongly shaped their course in the life of the city may readily become of sinister import frequently they are misunderstood and they easily misunderstand the problem is one of education but it is that most difficult problem of education for grown-ups here perhaps the library may render the most distinct service in that it can bring to them in their own tongues the ideals and the underlying principles of life and custom in their adopted country and through their children as they swarm into the children's rooms is established a point of contact which no other agency could so effectually provide under the repressive measures of old world governments the racial culture and national spirit of poles lithuanians finns balkan slavs and russian jews have been stunted here both are warmed into life and renewed vigor and in generous measure are given back to the land of their adoption such racial contribution must prove of enormous value whether as many sociologists believe this country is to prove a great melting pot for the fusing of many races or whether as dr zitlowski contends there is to be one country one set of laws one speech but a vast variety of national cultures contributing each its due share to the enrichment of the common stock great changes have come about in the methods that obtain for the exercise of popular government in a democracy whose chief strength is derived from an intelligent public opinion the sharpening of such intelligence and enlargement of general knowledge concerning affairs of common concern are of paramount importance statute books are heavily encumbered with laws that are enforced because public opinion goes counter to them non-enforcement breeds disrespect for law and unscientific making of laws leads to their disregard so the earliest attempts to find a remedy contemplated merely the legislator and the official bringing together for their use through the combined services of trained economists and of expert reference librarians the principles and foundation for contemplated legislation and the data as to similar attempts elsewhere fruitful as this service has proved within the limitation of state municipal officialdom a broadened conception of possibilities now enlarges the scope of work to include citizen organizations interested in the study of public questions students of sociology economics and political science businessmen keenly alive to the intimate association in a legitimate sense of business and politics and that new and powerful element in public affairs which has added three million voters to the poll lists in ten states and will soon add eleven million voters more in the remaining thirty-eight the new library service centering in state and municipal legislative reference libraries and in civics departments of large public libraries forecasts the era now rapidly approaching when aldermen and state representatives will still enact laws and state and city officials will enforce them but their making will be determined strictly by public opinion the local government of the future will be by quasi-public citizen organizations directing aldermen and state legislators accurately to register their will when representative government becomes misrepresentative in the words of a modern humorist democracy will ask the powers that be whether they are the powers that ought to be to intelligently determine the answer public opinion must not ignorantly ask this has been called the age of utilitarianism such it unquestionably is but its practicality is not disassociated from idealism the resources of numberless commercial enterprises are each in this day reckoned in millions and their products are figured in terms of many millions more as once thousands represented the spread of even the greatest of industries but more and more businessmen are coming to realize that business organization as it affects for weal or woe thousands who contribute to their success must be conducted as a trust for the common good and not merely for selfish exploitation or for oppression as the trade guilds of old wielded their vast power for common ends so all the workers gave the best at their command to make their articles of merchandise the most perfect that human skill and care could produce men of business whose executive skill determines the destiny of thousands in their employ are growing more and more to an appreciation of the trusteeship that is theirs a humane spirit is entering the relationship between employer and employed great commercial organizations are conducting elaborate investigations into conditions of housing sanitation prolongation of school life social insurance and similar subjects of betterment for the toilers 
but a brief span ago they were concerned chiefly with trade extension and lowering of wages, all unconcerned about the living conditions of their dependents. They too are now exemplifying the possession of that constructive imagination which builds large and beyond the present. For results that grow out of experience and of experiment, they also are in part dependent upon the sifted facts that are found in print. The business house library is a recent development, and administering in different ways to both employer and employed gives promise of widespread usefulness. With the tremendous recent growth of industrialism and the rapid multiplication of invention, the manifest need for making available the vast sum of gathered knowledge concerning the discoveries of modern science has evolved the great special libraries devoted to the varied subdivisions of the subject. Munificently endowed as many of them are, highly organized for ready access to material, administered to encourage use and to give expert aid as well, their great importance cannot be overestimated. What they accomplish is not wholly reducible to statistics, nor can their influence be readily traced, perhaps, to the great undertakings of today which overshadow the seven wonders of antiquity. But there can be no question that without the opportunities that here lie for study and research, and, no less important, without the skilled assistance freely rendered by librarian and bibliographer, special talent would often remain dormant and its possessor unsatisfied. Greater here would be the loss to society than to the individual. Thus, the libraries are endeavoring to make themselves useful in every field of human enterprise or interest, with books of facts for the information they possess, with books of inspiration for the stimulus they give and the power they generate. Conjointly, these yield the equipment which develops the constructive imagination, without which the world would seem but a sorry and a shriveled spot to dwell upon. The poet and the dreamer conceive the great things which are wrought, the scientist and the craftsman achieve them, and the scholar and the artist interpret them. Thus associated, they make their finest contribution to the common life. The builders construct the great monuments of iron and of concrete, which are the expression of this age, as the great cathedrals and abbeys were of generations that have passed. Adapted as they are to the needs of this day, our artists and our writers have shown us the beauty and the art which the modern handiwork of man possesses. With Etcher's tool, one man of keen insight has shown us the art that inheres in the lofty structures which line the great thoroughfares of our chief cities, the beauty of the skylines they trace with roof and pediment. With burning words, another has given voice to the machinery and to the vehicles of modern industry, and we thrill to the eloquence and glow of his poetic fervor. Great works of art are useful works greatly done, declares Dr. T.J. Cobden Sanderson, and rightly viewed the most prosaic achievements of this age, whether they be great canals or clusters of workmen's homes worthily built, or maybe more humble projects, have a greatness of meaning that carries with it the sense of beauty and of art. In medieval days, the heralds of civilization were the warrior, the missionary, the explorer, and the troubadour. In modern times, civilization is carried forward by the chemist, the engineer, the captain of industry, and the interpreter of life, whether the medium utilized be pen or brush or voice. Without vision, civilization would wither and perish, and so it may well be that the printed page shall serve as symbol of its supreme vision. Within the compass of the book sincerely written, rightly chosen, and well used are contained the three chief elements which justify the library of the people. Information, education, recreation. The urge of the world makes these demands. Ours is the high privilege to respond. End of section number two. Recording by Emily Hancock. Section 5 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Perry. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section 5. The Companionship of Books. 
Are books fitted to be our companions? That depends. You and I read them with pleasure. Others do not care for them. To some, the reading of any book at all is as impossible as the perusal of a volume in Old Slavonic would be to most of us. These people simply do not read at all. To a suggestion that he supplement his usual vacation sports by reading a novel, a New York police captain, a man with a common school education, replied, Well, I've never read a book yet, and I don't think I'll begin now. Here was a man who had never read a book who had no use for books, and who could get along perfectly well without them. He is not a unique type. Hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens might as well be quite illiterate, so far as the use that they make of their ability to read is concerned. These persons are not all uneducated. They possess and are still acquiring much knowledge, but since leaving school, they have acquired it chiefly by personal experience and by word of mouth. Is it possible that they are right? May it be that to read books is unnecessary and superfluous? There has been some effort of late to depreciate the book, to insist on its inadequacy and on the impracticality of the knowledge that it conveys. Book learning has always been derided more or less by so-called practical men. A recent series of comic pictures in the newspapers makes this clear. It is about book-taught Bilkins. Bilkins tries to do everything by a book. He raises vegetables, builds furniture, runs a chicken farm, all by the directions contained in books, and meets with ignominious failure. He makes himself, in fact, very ridiculous in every instance, and thousands of readers laugh at him and his absurd books. They inwardly resolve, doubtless, that they will be practical and will pay no attention to books. Are they right? Is the information contained in books always useless and absurd? while that obtained by experience or by talking to one's neighbor is always correct and valuable? Many of our foremost educators are displeased with the book. They are throwing it aside for the lecture, for laboratory work, for personal research and experiment. Does this mean that the book, as a tool of the teacher, will have to go? What it all certainly does mean is that we ought to pause a minute and think about the book, about what it does, and what it cannot do. This means that we ought to consider a little the whole subject of written as distinguished from spoken language. Why should we have two languages, as we practically do, one to be interpreted by the ear and the other by the eye? Could we or should we abandon either? What are the advantages and what the limitations of each? We are so accustomed to looking upon the printed page, to reading newspapers, books, and advertisements, to sending and receiving letters, written or typewritten, that we are apt to forget that all this is not part of the natural order, except in the sense that all inventions and creations of the human brain are natural. Written language is a conscious invention of man. Spoken language is a development shaped by his needs and controlled by his sense of what is fitting, but not at the outset consciously devised. We are apt to think of written language as simply a means of representing spoken language to the eye. But it is more than this. Originally, at least in many cases, it was not this at all. The written signs represented not sounds, but ideas themselves. If they were intended to correspond directly with anything, it was with the rude gestures that signified ideas and had nothing to do with their vocal expression. It was not until later that these written symbols came to correspond to vocal sounds, and even today they do so imperfectly. Languages that are largely phonetic are the exception. The result is, as I have said, that we have two languages, a spoken and a written. What we call reading aloud is translation from the written to the spoken tongue, while writing from dictation is translation from the spoken to the written. When we read, as we say, to ourselves, we sometimes, if we are not skillful, pronounce the spoken words under our breath, or at least form them with our vocal organs. You all remember the story of how the Irishman who could not read made his friend stop up his ears while reading a letter aloud, so that he might not hear it. This anecdote, like all good comic stories, has something in it to think about. The skillful reader does not even imagine the spoken words as he goes. 
he forgets, for the moment, the spoken tongue and translates the written words and phrases directly into the ideas for which they stand. A skillful reader thus takes in the meaning of a phrase, a sentence, even of a paragraph, at a glance. Likewise, the writer who sets his own thoughts down on paper need not voice them, even in imagination. He may also forget all about the spoken tongue and spread his ideas on the page at first hand. This is not so common because one writes slower than he speaks, whereas he reads very much faster. The swift reader could not imagine that he was speaking the words, even if he would. The pace is too incredibly fast. Our written tongue, then, has come to be something of a language by itself. In some countries, it has grown so out of touch with the spoken tongue that the two have little to do with each other. Where only the learned know how to read and write, the written language takes on a learned tinge. The popular spoken tongue has nothing to keep it steady and changes rapidly and unsystematically. Where nearly all who speak the language also read and write it, as in our own country, the written tongue, even in its highest literary forms, is apt to be much more familiar and colloquial. But at the same time, the written and the spoken tongue keep closer together. Still, they never accurately correspond. When a man talks like a book, or in other words, uses such language that it could be printed word for word and appear in good literary form, we recognize that he is not talking ordinary colloquial English, not using the normal spoken language. On the other hand, when the speech of a Southern Negro or a Down East Yankee is set down in print, as it so often is in the modern dialect story, we recognize at once that although for the occasion this is written language, it is not normal literary English. It is most desirable that the two forms of speech shall closely correspond, for then the written speech gets life from the spoken, and the spoken has the written for its governor and controller. But it is also desirable that each should retain more or less individuality, and fortunately it is almost impossible that they should not do so. We must not forget, therefore, that our written speech is not merely a way of setting down our spoken speech in print. This is exactly what our friends, the spelling reformers, appear to have forgotten. The name that they have given to what they propose to do indicates this clearly. When a word as written and as spoken have drifted apart, it is usually the spoken word that has changed. Reform, therefore, would be accomplished by restoring the old spoken form. Instead of this, it is proposed to change the written form. In other words, the two languages are to be forced together by altering that one of them that is by its essence the most immutable. Where the written word has been corrupted, as in spelling guild for guild, the adoption of the simplest spelling is a reform. Otherwise, not. Now, is the possession of two languages, a spoken and a written, an advantage or not? With regard to the spoken tongue, the question answers itself. If we were all deaf and dumb, we could still live and carry on business, but we should be badly handicapped. On the other hand, if we could neither read nor write, we should simply be in the position of our remote forefathers, or even of many in our own day and our own land. What then is the reasons for a separate written language, beyond the variety thereby secured by the use of two senses, hearing and sight, instead of only one? Evidently, the chief reason is that written speech is eminently fitted for preservation. Without the transmittal of ideas from one generation to another, intellectual progress is impossible. Such transmittal, before the invention of writing, was effected solely by memory. The father spoke to the son, and he, remembering what was said, told it in turn to the grandson. This is tradition, sometimes marvelously accurate, but often untrustworthy. And, as it is without check, there is no way of telling whether a given fact, so transmitted, is or is not handed down faithfully. Now we have the phonograph, for preserving and accurately reproducing spoken language. If this had been invented before the introduction of written language, we might never have had the latter. As it is, the device comes on the field too late to be a competitor with the book in more than a very limited field. 
for preserving particular voices, such as those of great men, or for recording intonation and pronunciation, it fills a want that writing and printing could never supply. For the long preservation of ideas and their conveyance to a human mind, written speech is now the indispensable vehicle. And, as has been said, this is how man makes progress. We learn in two ways, by undergoing and reflecting on our own experiences and by reading and reflecting on those of others. Neither of these ways is sufficient in itself. A child bound hand and foot and confined in a dark room would not be a fit subject for instruction, but neither would he reach a high level if placed on a desert island far from his kind and forced to rely solely on his own experiences. The experiences of our forebears read in the light of our own, the experiences of our forebears used as a starting point from which we may move forward to fresh fields. These we must know and appreciate if we are to make progress. This means the book and its use. Books may be used in three ways, for information, for recreation, for inspiration. There are some who feel inclined to rely implicitly on the information that is to be found in books, to believe that a book cannot lie. This is an unfortunate state of mind. The word of an author set down in print is worth no more than when he gives it to us in spoken language. No more and no less. There was, to be sure, a time when the printed word implied at least care and thoughtfulness. It is still true that the book implies somewhat more of this than the newspaper, but the difference between the two is becoming unfortunately less. Now, a wrong record, if it purports to be a record of facts, is worse than none at all. The man who desires to know the distance between two towns in Texas and is unable to find it in any book of reference may obtain it at the cost of some time and trouble. But if he finds it wrongly recorded, he accepts the result and goes away believing a lie. If we are to use books for information, therefore, it is of the utmost consequence that we know whether the information is correct or not. A general critical evaluation of all literature, even on this score alone, without going into the question of literary merit, is probably beyond the possibilities, although it has been seriously proposed. Some partial lists we have, and a few lists of those lists, so that we may know where to get at them. There are many books about books, especially in certain departments of history, technology, or art, but no one place to which a man may go before he begins to read his book to find out whether he may believe what he reads in it. This is a serious lack, especially as there is more than one point of view. Books that are of high excellence as literature may not be at all accurate. How shall the boy who hears enthusiastic praise of Prescott's histories and who is spellbound when he reads them know that the results of recent investigation prove that those histories give a totally incorrect idea of Mexico and Peru? How is the future reader of Dr. Cook's interesting account of the ascent of Mount McKinley to know that it has been discredited? And how is he to know whether other interesting and well-written histories and books of travel have not been similarly proved inaccurate? At present, there is no way except to go to one who knows the literature of the subject, or to read as many other books on the subject as can be obtained, weighing one against the other and coming to one's own conclusions. Possibly, the public library may be able to help. Mr. Charles F. Loomis of the Los Angeles Library advocates labeling books with what he calls poison labels to warn the reader when they are inaccurate or untrustworthy. Most librarians have hesitated a little to take so radical a step as this, not so much from unwillingness to assume the duty of warning the public as from feeling that they were not competent to undertake the critical evaluation of the whole of the literature of special subjects. The librarian may know that this or that book is out of date or not to be depended on, but there are others about which he is not certain or regarding which he must rely on what others tell him, and he knows that expert testimony is notoriously one-sided. It is this fear of acting as an advocate instead of as a judge that has generally deterred the librarian from labeling his books with notes of advice or warning. 
There is, however, no reason why the librarian should take sides in the matter. He may simply point out to the reader that there are other books on the same subject, written from different points of view, and he may direct attention to these, letting the reader draw his own conclusions. There is probability that the public library in the future will furnish information and guidance of this kind about books, more than it has done in the past. And here, it may be noted in passing that the library is coming out of its shell. It no longer holds itself aloof, taking good care of its books and taking little care of the public that uses them. It is coming to realize that the man and the book are complementary, that neither is much without the other, and that to bring them together is its duty. It realizes also that a book is valuable, not because it is so much paper and ink and thread and leather, but because it records and preserves somebody's ideas. It is the projection of a human mind across space and across time, and where it touches another human mind, those minds have come into contact just as truly and with as valuable results as if the bodies that held them stood face to face in actual converse. This is the miracle of written speech a miracle renewed daily in millions of places with millions of readers. We have, in the modern library, the very best way of perpetuating such relations as this and of ensuring that such as are preserved shall be worth preserving. When the ancients desired to make an idea carry as far as possible, they saw to the toughness and strength of the material object constituting the record. They cut it in stone or cast it in metal, forgetting that all matter is in a state of continual flux and change. It is the idea only that endures. Stone and metal will both one day pass away, and unless someone sees fit to copy the inscription on a fresh block or tablet, the record will be lost. It is, then, only by continual renewal of its material basis that a record in written language can be made to last and there is no reason why this renewal should not take place every few years as well as every few centuries. There is even an advantage in frequent renewal, for this ensures that the value of the record shall be more frequently passed upon and prevents the preservation of records that are not worth keeping. This preservation by frequent renewal is just what is taking place with books. We make them of perishable materials. If we want to keep them, we reprint them. Otherwise, they decay and are forgotten. We should not forget that by this plan, the reader is usually made the judge of whether a book is worth keeping. Why do we preserve by continual reprinting Shakespeare and Scott and Tennyson and Hawthorne? The reprinting is done by publishers as a money-making scheme. It is profitable to them because there is a demand for those authors. If we cease to care for them and prefer unworthy writers, Shakespeare and Scott will decay and be forgotten and the unworthy ones will be preserved. Thus, a great responsibility is thrown upon readers. So far, they have judged pretty well. Just now, however, we are confining ourselves to the use of books for information, and here there is less preservation than elsewhere, especially in science statements and facts quickly become out of date. Here, it is not the old, but the new that we want. The new based on the accurate and enduring part of the old. Before we leave this part of the subject, it may be noted that many persons have no idea of the kinds of information that may be obtained from books. Even those who would unhesitatingly seek a book for data in history, art, or mathematics would not think of going to books for facts on plumbing, weaving, or shoemaking, for methods of shop window decoration, or for display advertising, for special forms of bookkeeping suitable for factories or for stock farms, for a host of facts relating to trades, occupations, and business in general. Yet, there are books about all these things. Not books perhaps to read for an idle hour, but books full of meat for them who want just this kind of food. If Book Todd Bilkins fails, after trying to utilize what such books have taught him, it is doubtless because he has previously failed to realize that books plus experience, or, to put it differently, the recorded experience of others 
plus our own is better than either could be separately. And the same is true of information that calls for no physical action to supplement it. Books plus thought, the thoughts of others plus our own, are more effective in combination than either could be by itself. Reading should provoke thought. Thought should suggest more reading, and so on, until others' thoughts and our own have become so completely amalgamated that they are our personal intellectual possessions. But we may not read for information at all. Recreation may be what we are after. Do not misunderstand me. Many persons have an idea that if one reads to amuse himself, he must necessarily read novels. I think most highly of good novels. Narrative is a popular form of literary expression. It is used by those who wish to instruct as well as to amuse. One may obtain plenty of information from novels, often in a form nowhere else available. If we want exact statement, statistical or otherwise, we do not go to fiction for it. But if we wish to obtain what is often more important, accurate and lasting general impressions of history, society, or geography, the novel is often the only place where these may be had. Likewise, one may amuse himself with history, travel, science, or art, even with mathematics. The last is rarely written primarily to amuse, although we have such a title as Mathematical Recreations, but there are plenty of nonfiction books written for entertainment, and one may read for entertainment any book whatever. The result depends not so much on the book or its contents as on the reader. Recreation is now recognized as an essential part of education. And just as physical recreation consists largely in the same muscular movements that constitute work, only in different combinations and with different ends in view, so mental recreation consists of intellectual exercise with a similar variation of combinations and aims. Somebody says that play is work that you don't have to do. So reading for amusement may closely resemble study. The only difference is that it is purely voluntary. Here again, however, the written language is only an intermediary. We have as before the contact of two minds. Only here, it is often the lighter contact of good fellowship. And one who reads always for such recreation is thus like the man who is always bandying trivialities, storytelling, and jesting. An excellent, even a necessary, way of passing part of one's time, but a mistaken way of employing all of it. The best kind of recreation is gently stimulating, but stimulation may rise easily to abnormality. There are fiction drunkards, just as there are persons who take too much alcohol or too much coffee. In fact, if one is so much absorbed by the ideas that he is assimilating that the process interferes with the ordinary duties of life, he may be fairly sure that it is injuring him. If one loves coffee or alcohol or even candy so dearly that one cannot give it up, it is time to stop using it altogether. If a reader is so fond of an exciting story that he cannot lay it aside so that he sits up late at night reading it, or if he cannot drop it from his mind when he does lay it aside, but goes on thinking about the deadly combat between the hero and Lord William Fitzgrouchy when he ought to be studying his lessons or attending to his business, it is time to cut out fiction altogether. This advice has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the fiction. It will not do simply to warn the habitual drunkard that he must be careful to take none but the best brands. He must drop alcohol altogether. If you are a fiction drunkard, enhanced quality will only enslave you further. This sort of use is no more recreation in the proper sense of the word than is gambling or drinking to excess or smoking opium. And now we come to a use of books that is more important lies more at the root of things than their use for either information or recreation. Their use for inspiration. One may get help and inspiration along with the other two. Reading about how to make a box may inspire a boy to go out and make one himself. It is this kind of thing that should be the final outcome of every mental process. Nothing that goes on in the brain is really complete until it ends in a motor stimulus. The action, it is true, may not follow closely. 
It may be the result of years of mental adjustment. It may even take place in another body from the one where it originated. The man who tells us how to make a box and tells it so fascinatingly that he sets all his readers to box making presumably has made boxes with his own hands. But there may be those who are fitted to inspire action in others rather than to undertake it themselves. And the larger literature of inspiration is not that which urges to specific deeds like box making or even to classes of deeds like caring for the sick or improving methods of transportation. Rather, does it include in its scope all good thoughts and all good actions. It makes better men and women of those who read it. It is revolutionary and evolutionary at the same time in the best sense of both words. What will thus inspire me, do you ask? It would be easy to try to tell you. It would also be easy to fail. Many have tried and failed. This is a deeply personal matter. I cannot tell what book or what passage in a book will touch the magic spring that shall make your life useful instead of useless, that shall start your thoughts and your deeds climbing up instead of groveling or passively waiting. Only search will reveal it. The diamond miner who expects to be directed to the precise spot where he will find a gem will never pick one up. Only he who seeks finds. There are, however, places to look and places to avoid. The peculiar clay in which diamonds occur is well known to mineralogists. He who runs across it looks for diamonds, though he may find none. But he who hunts for them on the rock-ribbed hills of New Hampshire or the sea sands of Florida is doing a foolish thing, although even there he may conceivably pick up one that has been dropped by accident. So you may know where it is best to go in your search for inspiration from books, for we know where seekers in the past have most often found it. He who could read the Bible or Shakespeare without finding some of it is the exception. It may be looked for in the great poets, Homer, Virgil, Dante, Chaucer, Milton, Hugo, Keats, Goethe, or the great historians, Tacitus, Herodotus, Frozar, Macaulay, Taine, Bancroft, or in the great travelers from Sir John Mandeville down, or in biographies like Boswell's Life of Johnson, or in books of science, Laplace, Lagrange, Darwin, Tyndall, Helmholtz, in the lives of the great artists, in the great novels and romances, Thackeray, Balzac, Hawthorne, Dickens, George Eliot. Yet, each and all of these may leave you cold, and you may pick up your gem in some out-of-the-way corner where neither you nor anyone else would think of looking for it. Did you ever see a car conductor fumbling about in the dark with the trolley pole, trying to hit the wire? While he is pulling it down and letting it fly up again, making fruitless dabs in the air, the car is dark and motionless. In vain, the motorman turns his controller. In vain do the passengers long for light. But sooner or later, the pole strikes the wire. Down it flows the current that was there all the time up in the air. In a jiffy, the car is in motion and ablaze with light. So your search for inspiration in literature may be long and unsuccessful. You are dark and motionless. But the life-giving current from some great man's brain is flowing through some book not far away. One day you will make the connection and your life will in a trice be filled with light and instinct with action. And before we leave this subject of inspiration, let us dwell for a moment on that to be obtained from one's literary setting in general, from the totality of one's literary associations and impressions as distinguished from that gained from some specific passage or idea. It has been said that it takes two to tell the truth, one to speak and one to listen. In like manner, we may say that two persons are necessary to a great artistic interpretation, one to create and one to appreciate, and of no art is this more true than it is of literature. The thought that we are thus cooperating with Shakespeare and Schiller and Hugo 
in bringing out the full effect of their deathless conceptions is an inspiring one and its consideration may aid us in realizing the essential oneness of the human race so far as its intellectual life is concerned would you rather be a citizen of the united states than we will say of nicaragua you might be as happy as well educated as well off there as here why do you prefer your present status simply and solely because of associations and relationships if this is sentiment as it doubtless is it is the kind of sentiment that rules the world it is in the same class as friendship loyalty love of kin affection for home the links that bind us to the past and the threads that stretch out into the future are more satisfactory to us here in the united states with the complexity of its interests for us than they would be in nicaragua or guam or iceland then of what country in the realm of literature do you desire to be a citizen of the one where shakespeare is king and where your familiar and daily speech is with the great ones of this earth those whose wise witty good or inspiring words spoken for centuries past have been recorded in books or would you prefer to dwell with triviality and banality perhaps with laura jean libby or even with mary j holmes and those a little better than these or a little worse i am one of those who believe in the best associations literary as well as social and associations may have their effect even if they are apparently trivial or superficial when the open shelf library was first introduced we were told that one of its chief advantages was that it encouraged browsing the somewhat aimless rambling about and dipping here and there into a book obviously this cannot be done in a closed shelf library but of late it has been suggested in one quarter or another that although this may be a pleasant occupation to some or even to most it is not a profitable one opponents of the open shelf of whom there are still one or two here and there find in this conclusion a reason for negativing the argument in its favor while those of its advocates who accept this view see in it only a reason for basing that argument wholly on other grounds now those of us who like a thing do not relish being told that it is not good for us we feel that pleasure was intended as an outward sign of benefits received and although it may in abnormal conditions deceive us we are right in demanding proof before distrusting its indications when the cow absorbs physical nutriment by browsing she does so without further reason than that she likes it does the absorber of mental pabulum from books argue wrongly from similar premises many things are hastily and wrongly condemned because they do not achieve certain results that they were not intended to achieve and in particular when a thing exists in several degrees or grades some one of those grades is often censured although good in itself because it is not a grade or two higher obviously everything depends on what is required when a shopper wants just three yards of cloth she would be foolish to buy four she would of course be even more foolish to imagine that if she really wished for three would do just as well but if a man wants to go to the eighth story of a building he should not be condemned because he does not mount to the ninth if he wishes a light lunch he should not be found fault with for not ordering a seven course dinner and yet we continually hear persons accused of superficiality who purposely and knowingly acquire some slight degree of knowledge of a subject instead of a higher degree and others are condemned we will say for reading for amusement when they might have read for serious information without inquiring whether amusement in this instance was not precisely what they needed it may be therefore that browsing is productive of some good result and that it fails to affect some other perhaps some higher result which its critics have wrongly fixed upon as the one desirable thing in this connection when a name embodies a figure of speech we may often learn something by following up the figure to see how far it holds good what does an animal do and what does it not do when it browses in the first place it eats food fresh growing food but secondly 
It eats this food by cropping off the tips of the herbage, not taking much at once, and again, it moves about from place to place, eating now here and now there, and then making selection, from one motive or another, but presumably following the dictates of its own taste or fancy. What does it not do? First, it does not, from choice, eat anything bad. Secondly, it does not necessarily consume all of its food in this way. If it finds a particularly choice spot, it may confine its feeding to that spot. Or, if its owner sees fit, he may remove it to the stable, where it may stand all day and eat what he chooses to give it. The benefits of browsing are, first, the nourishment actually derived from the food taken, coupled with the fact that it is taken in small quantities and in great variety. And secondly, the knowledge of good spots, obtained from the testing of one spot after another throughout the whole broad pasture. Now I submit that our figure of speech holds good in all these particulars. The literary browser partakes of his mental food from books and is thereby nourished and stimulated. He takes it here and there in brief quantities, moving from section to section and from shelf to shelf, selecting choice morsels of literature as fancy may dictate. He does not, if he is a healthy reader, absorb voluntarily anything that will hurt him, and this method of literary absorption does not preclude other methods of mental nourishment. He may like a book so much that he proceeds to devour it whole, or his superiors in knowledge may remove him to a place where necessary mental food is administered more or less forcibly. And having gone so far with our comparison, we shall make no mistake if we go a little further and say that the benefits of browsing to the reader are twofold, as they are to the material feeder. The absorption of actual nutriment in his own willful, wayward manner, a little at a time and in great variety, and the knowledge of good reading obtained from such a wide testing of the field. Are not these real benefits, and are they not desirable? I fear that our original surmise was correct and that browsing is condemned not for what it does but because it fails to do something that it could not be expected to do. Of course, if one were to browse continuously, he would be unable to feed in any other way. Attendance upon school or the continuous reading of any book whatever would be obviously impossible. To avoid misunderstanding, therefore, we will agree at this point that whatever may be said here in commendation of browsing is on condition that it be occasional and not excessive and that the normal amount of continuous reading and study proceed together with it. Having settled, therefore, that browsing is a good thing when one does not occupy one's whole time with it, let us examine its advantages a little more in detail. First, about the mental nourishment that is absorbed in browsing. The specific information, the appreciation of what is good, the intellectual stimulation, not that which comes from reading suggested or guided browsing, but from the actual process itself. I have heard it strenuously denied that any such absorption occurs. The bits taken are too small. The motion of the browser is too rapid. The whole process is too desultory. Let us see. In the first place, a knowledge of authors and titles and of the general character of their works is by no means to be despised. I heard the other day of a presumably educated woman who betrayed in a conversation her ignorance of Omar Khayyam, not lack of acquaintance with his works, but lack of knowledge that such a person had ever existed. If, at some period in her life, she had held in her hand a copy of the Rubaiyat and had glanced at his back without even opening it, how much embarrassment she might have been spared. And if, in addition, she had glanced within for just ten seconds and had discovered that he wrote poetry in stanzas of four lines each, she would have known as much about Omar as do many of those who would contemptuously scoff at her ignorance. With so brief effort, may we acquire literary knowledge sufficient to avoid embarrassment in ordinary conversation. Browsing in a good library if the browser has a memory, will soon equip him with a wide range of knowledge of this kind.
nor is such knowledge to be sneered at as superficial it is all that we know or need to know about scores of authors one may never study higher mathematics but it may be good for him to know that lagrange was a french author who wrote on analytical mechanics that euclid was a greek geometer and that hamilton invented quaternions all this and vastly more may be impressed on the mind by an hour in the mathematical alcove of a library of moderate size and it will do no harm to a boy to know that benvenuto cellini wrote his autobiography even if the inevitable perusal of the book is delayed for several years or that felicia hemmins james thompson and robert herrick wrote poetry independently of familiarity with their works or that la mia is not something to eat or as you like it a popular novel information of this kind is almost impossible to acquire from lists or from oral statement whereas a moment's handling of a book in the concrete may fix it in the mind for good and all so far we have not supposed that even a word of the contents has been read what now if a sentence a stanza a paragraph a page passes into the brain through the eye those who measure literary effect by the thousand words or by the hour are making a great mistake the lightning flash is over in a fraction of a second but in that time it may reveal a scene of beauty may give the traveller warning of the fatal precipice or may shatter the farmer's home into kindling wood intellectual lightning may strike the browser as he stands there book in hand before the shelf a word a phrase may sear into his brain may turn the current of his whole life and even if no such epic-making words meet his eye in how brief a time may he read digest appreciate some of the gems of literature lee hunt's jenny kissed me would probably take about thirty seconds on a second reading he would have it by heart the joy of a lifetime how many meaty epigrams would take as long the whole of gray's elegy is hardly beyond the browser's limit in an editorial on the harvard classics in the chicago evening post april twenty second we read the cultural tabloid has very little virtue to gain everything that a book has to give one must be submerged in it saturated and absorbed this is very much like saying there is very little nourishment in a sandwich to get the full effect of a luncheon you must eat everything on the table it is a truism to say that you cannot get everything in a book without reading all of it but it by no means follows that the virtue of less than the whole is negligible so much for the direct effect of what one may thus take in bit by bit the indirect effect is even more important for by sampling a whole literature as he does he not only gets a bird's eye view of it but he finds out what he likes and what he dislikes he begins to form his taste are you afraid that he will form it wrong i am not we are assuming that the library where he browses is a good one here is no chance of evil only a choice between different kinds of good and even if the evil be there it is astonishing how the healthy mind will let it slip and fasten eagerly on the good would you prefer a taste fixed by someone who tells the browser what he ought to like then that is not the reader's own taste at all but that of his informant we have too much of this sort of thing too many readers without an atom of taste of their own who will say for instance that they adore george meredith because someone has told them that all intellectual persons do so the man who frankly loves george ade and can yet see nothing in shakespeare may one day discover shakespeare the man who reads shakespeare merely because he thinks he ought to is hopeless but what a triumph to stand spellbound by the art of a writer whose name you never heard and then discover that he is one of the great ones of the world not is comparable to it except perhaps to pick out all by yourself in the exhibition the one picture that the experts have chosen for the museum or to be able to say you liked olives the first time you tasted them who are your favorites 
Did someone guide you to them or did you find them yourselves? I will warrant that in many cases you discovered them and that this is why you love them. I discovered De Quincey's romances, Prayed's poetry, Beringer in French, Heine in German, The Arabian Nights, Moliere, Irving's Alhambra, hundreds of others probably. I am sure that I love them all far more than if someone had told me they were good books. If I had been obliged to read them in school and pass an examination on them, I should have hated them. The teacher who can write an examination paper on Gray's elegy would, I firmly believe, cut up his grandmother alive before the physiology class. And next to the author or the book that you have discovered yourself comes the one that the discoverer himself, your boy or girlfriend, tells you about. He knows a good thing. She knows it. No school nonsense about that. No adult misunderstanding. I found out Poe that way, and Thackeray's Major Gehagen, and many others. To go back to our old illustration, and consider for a moment not the book, but the mind, the personality whose ideas it records. Such association with books represents association with one's fellow men in society, at a reception, in school or college, at a club. Some we pass by with a nod, with some we exchange a word. Sometimes there is a warm hand grasp, sometimes a long conversation. No matter what the mental contact may be, it has its effects. We are continually gaining knowledge, making new friends, receiving fresh inspiration. The complexion of this kind of daily association determines the cast of one's mind, the thoroughness of his taste, the usefulness or uselessness of what he does. A man is known by the company he keeps, because that company forms him. He gets from it what becomes brain of his brain and soul of his soul. And no less is he formed by his mental associations with the good and the great of all ages, whom he meets in books and who talk to him there. More rather than less. For into a book, the writer puts generally what is best in him, laying aside the pettiness the triviality, the downright wickedness that may have characterized him in the flesh. I have often heard the comment from one who had met face to face a writer whose work he loved. Oh, he disappointed me so. How disappointed might we be with Thackeray, with Dickens, even with Shakespeare, could we meet them in the flesh? Now they cannot disappoint us, for we know only what they have left on record, the best, the most enduring part, purified from what is gross and earthly. In and among such company as this, it is your privilege to live and move, almost without money and without price. Thank God for books. Let them be your friends and companions through life, for information, for recreation, but above all, for inspiration. End of section 5 Recorded by Melissa Perry. Section 6 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. Why do we need a public library? By Various. Section 6. Two Fundamentals by Mary Salome Cutler. Mary Salome Cutler, now Mrs. Milton Fairchild, is the first librarian to be quoted in this symposium. A sketch of her appears in volume two of this series. In the paragraphs quoted below, which form part of a paper read by Miss Cutler, then vice director of the New York State Library School, before the Pennsylvania Library Club and printed in the Library Journal, October 1896, appears a definite recognition of the social character of the library's task. Her two fundamentals, organization and human feelings, are both decided elements in its socialization. In considering library interests, we do well, I think, not to confine ourselves to the limited range of library subjects. 
that mysterious thing which we call society is growing more complex every part more curiously intertwined with every other part each human life bearing some relation to every other human life whether he will or no it is literally true that no man liveth to himself alone if it were possible then as a part of this organism to discover some of the laws which govern the whole we might come back to our special domain with an application of the laws which would have the force of freshness I believe that we gain an insight into these controlling principles only by yielding to the tendency of solidarity, by opening ourselves to surrounding influences, by living the fullest life of which we are capable. I think I have seen the workings of two of these laws which have a close relation to each other. If I am right, your experience will confirm mine, and we can together make the application to what concerns us most, the library interests of today. In any undertaking, results depend directly, and often largely, upon the perfection of organization. Organization implies a mind which can grasp the undertaking as a whole, follow it out, each step in detail, estimate the various factors, personal and impersonal, provide for unforeseen contingencies, and furnish the faith, the willpower, the personal magnetism, whatever you choose to call it, in such measure as is needed to carry it through. Such a mind sees the end at the beginning and thinks of it as already done, while to others it may seem far off and even impossible. Such thought, often the work of one mind, sometimes the result of cooperation, is behind every piece of accomplished work. Other elements may doubtless be essential, but there can be no adequate results without organization. And making allowance for other elements, the perfection of results depends upon the perfection of organization. For the reason of this tendency we have not far to seek. I believe it is found in the scientific spirit of the age, which is surely pervading every sphere of human thought and activity. The careful investigation of facts, the deduction of the law from the phenomena, the distrust of chance, and the loyalty to the law deduced, all of which evidence the scientific spirit, mark alike the great financier, diplomatist, inventor, philanthropist. In some undertakings, organization alone will suffice. For example, making a machine, laying out a railroad, compiling a volume of statistics. In others, there must needs come in what I will call the human element, the consideration of people, not in masses, but as individuals, that matchless, indescribable quality which we call human sympathy. Illustrations might be multiplied in educational, religious, and philanthropic efforts where we work for the masses, and forget that each one of the mass is a human being with passions, sensibilities, aspirations like our own. This interest in the human being as such, which is a gift to some, can be cultivated, but it can never be simulated. The counterfeit always rings false. Joined to a good memory for names and faces, it gives a person a power which can hardly be estimated. It seems to me that these two principles apply with tremendous and unusual force to the problems of the modern library. I will speak of the public library alone because it has a wider reach and a closer touch on life. We will review in imagination the library situation in this country. We take up Mr. Flint's statistics volume for 1893. We sum up 593 free libraries in the New England states, 520 in New York, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, 285 in the southern states, 758 in the western states, a total of 2,156 free libraries. We recall our friends in the American Library Association, who constitute, with some marked exceptions who prefer to work alone, the high watermark of the fraternity. As their names pass before us, we take a measure of the men and women. We think of their libraries which we may have visited, or better still, which we have used as readers. In some few cases, we know the influence of these libraries in the town or city. Take it for all in all, we find a body of hard-working men and women translating into practice noble ideals. As a result, the library is beginning to get a hold upon the community. But it is only a beginning, and compared with the possibilities, only a prophecy of what may and will be. Are not the failures in our work due to the lack of the best organization and the true human touch? A librarian is appointed, let us say, to an important post. He has doubtless had experience in library work. 
he comes on to consult with the trustees. They vote to send him on a trip for getting ideas from other libraries. He probably has on his hands a beautiful building, illy adapted to library work. He carries the plans with him and spends most of the time with other members of the craft in choosing the least of several evils in placing the reference room, catalog, charging desk, etc. He secures two or three assistants with training, experience, or both, and fills the minor places with local help chosen by examination or by luck or by personal favor. He learns in a general way the character of the town and selects books with that in view. If there are certain manufacturing interests or a particular foreign population, he makes large purchases in those lines. He decides on a system of classification, of cataloging, and on a method of charging. The books are rushed through the various processes, though all too slowly for an impatient public. In a few months, at the latest, the big educational plant begins to be utilized. The circulation surprises the most sanguine. The average of fiction drops a little below the usual mark. Good service is done at the information or reference desk by the enthusiastic man or woman having it in charge. Work is begun with the schools, and a little fraction of teachers make the children know books because they know books themselves. The rest go through the motions. The bookworm fills his corner. The chronic gambler has his little say. The usual number of prize questions are answered. The library becomes the very bread of life to those who are ready to receive it, and gives refreshment and suggestion and inspiration to many more. The profession approves. At the next ALA meeting, Mr. So-and-so is brought forward more prominently, and the wise ones say, I always thought he was a rising man. But only 20% of the population ever set foot within the library, and when a stranger asks the way within a block of the building, a fairly intelligent-looking workman does not appear to know there is such a thing as the public library. In looking over the proceedings of the Library Association for the 18 years of its existence, we are struck by the evidences of industry and earnestness. There are papers and discussions on libraries and schools, access to the shelves, bookbinding, systems of classification, cataloging rules. The keynote is cooperation in securing, with an enthusiasm which amounts to missionary zeal, the best and most uniform methods, with special reference to mechanical devices. The very motto smacks of arithmetic and commerce, the best reading for the largest number at the least cost. All this is good and proper in its place. Wise methods are essential to the best results, but we sought in vain all along the years for the philosophic insight which should grasp the higher motive of our profession and connect it with the great struggles of our modern life. After the Columbus year, in the clearer air of the mountain top, the word for which we were waiting came. I wish it were possible to stop right here and give you the papers of Mr. Larned and Mr. Brett, which were read at Lake Placid, as well as the discussions which followed. I must content myself by quoting Mr. Larned's last sentence. Those of us who have faith in the future of democracy can only hold our faith fast by believing that the knowledge of the learned, the wisdom of the thoughtful, the conscious of the upright, will some day be common enough to prevail always over every factious folly and every mischievous movement that evil minds or ignorance can set astir. When that blessed time of victory shall have come, there will be many to share the glory of it, but none among them will rank rightly before those who have led and inspired the work of the public libraries. This leads us to the first great need of the profession today, that the librarian should be, in the noblest sense, a large man, that he should add to executive and business ability and technical knowledge a broad and generous culture, in Matthew Arnold's sense of the word, an inward spiritual activity having for its character increased sweetness, increased light, increased life, increased sympathy. He must be an omnivorous reader, skimming many books, and knowing by instinct which books and which chapters and sentences to read carefully. He must study from books and in life the great industrial, social, and religious questions which stir our age. He must be a scholar without pedantry, a man of the world without indifference, and a friend of the people without sentimentality. There follows, naturally, the second necessity, that the librarian should be a careful student of his own town. 
he should know its history and topography, its social, political, business, literary, and ecclesiastical life. To this end, he should have a personal acquaintance with the city officers, the party bosses, the labor leaders, members of the board of trade, manufacturers, leading women in society, with the clergy, with the school superintendent and the teachers, with those who shape the charitable organizations, with reporters, policemen, and reformers. To what end? Broadly, that he may catch the spirit of the civic life and relate the library to the whole as the organs to the body. Specifically, that he may reach the entire population through the natural leaders, that he may select books, establish branches, open up new avenues of communication between the library and the people. The church may be aristocratic, industry, trade, and politics, a war, the public school like the drinking fountain, though planned for the many scorned by the few. I believe it is possible for a man with a broad and sympathetic knowledge of our age and an intimate knowledge of his own city to make of the public library the one common meeting place, the real focus of democratic ideas. The church and the school will reach this in the future. The library may achieve it today. There is a third difficulty, which is a very real and palpable one. The librarian himself may have a fairly high ideal of the library, which is shared by perhaps one or two assistants. The bulk of the work in a library with a large circulation is done by young persons of less opportunity and training. Each has a distinct part of the work to do with little ideas of its relation to the whole. Unfortunately, the loan desk, registration desk, and reading room are usually manned in this way, I have often stood amazed at the delivery desk of librarians whose names represent all that is best in the library profession. I would not be understood as deprecating the work of the lower assistants in our libraries. I know well that this service as a whole represents an amount of faithfulness and devotion which it ill becomes me to undervalue. The responsibility lies with the head of the library, and the failure comes from lack of organization. The appointing power should be practically in his hands. The man whom we have described above does not need to seek this power, it comes to him. It is surely possible to secure for the library service young men and women, boys and girls, of fair intelligence, quick wits, responsive minds, and human sympathies. The making of these units into an organism is the severest test of a librarian's power. The ability of a general is not enough. He must himself have the real human touch, or he cannot call it forth from others. There must be the promptness, the accuracy, the dispatch, which marks military discipline. There must also be an intelligent conception of the purpose of the library, a strong sense of personal responsibility and of the dignity and beauty of the public service. It is sometimes said that the spirit of the library should be that of a merchant and his well-trained clerks, anxious to please their customers. It should be rather the fine spirit of a hostess with the daughters of the house about her greeting her guests. There is a fourth failure, which is perhaps the root difficulty. It is the failure to make the most of time. The day opens, the man hastens to his place and finds a score of voices calling him to as many different tasks. He hastily begins the one which seems to call the loudest and has just begun to gather up the threads of thought when there is a peremptory call in another direction. And so he is driven through the day, not controlling, but controlled, and constantly lashed by the thought of neglected duties. By dint of keeping at it through the day, and often into the night, much work is done. The man gets and deserves the reputation of a hard-working man, deliberately sacrificing health, ease, leisure, and the joys of a scholar's life for the public good. Now, this is the first and natural result of the enlarged conception of a librarian's work. The man is dazed by the sense of responsibility and almost crushed by the demands upon his time, apparently separate and conflicting. But this should be considered only the first process from which the strong man will speedily evolve a wiser way. The fatal mistake lies in considering this first stage inevitable and final. If a man tarries here, it argues limitation, not power. There are certainly men who stand high in public life, as well as those holding less prominent positions, who accomplish an enormous amount of work with a sense of freedom and an impression of leisure. 
as i have observed individual cases i am led to the conclusion that the explanation lies not in a stronger physique or a stronger intellect but in a better organization of work with reference to time there is no need more imperative than this for all of us who are proud to be called busy people the trouble is we think we are too busy to stop and plan our philosophic error lies in believing that the work must all be done today nature herself should teach us that the best work cannot be done in a hurry we may not hope in this generation to understand well the working of that complex mysterious thing which we call human society but we may at least so relate ourselves and our libraries to it that we may live move and grow together not unrelated ununified but to each thought and thing allied is perfect nature's every part rooted in the mighty heart End of section 6